All right. Good morning, Rescue House Church. How are you doing this morning? You doing all right? Made it to the house. I uh, hope you're ready for what God has to say to you today. Um, I believe I have uh, probably, maybe, possibly one of the most important uh, messages for you today uh, that I believe if you'll take it in, uh, you'll let it sink in, you'll put it into action. I believe God is going to uh, use it in a, in a very, very uh, powerful way. Uh, a couple of family just items for us before I jump into today's sermon. Uh, one is um, our house party this Wednesday night. I really, really want to encourage you uh, to be at the house party. Anybody excited about the house party? Come on, somebody. It's going to be fun. It's going to be full of vision. It's going to be full of worship. Uh, everybody who shows up is going to get one of those legit uh, Rescue House shirts that the band was wearing up here. Uh, so you get that for free. You got to show up, get there early. I want to encourage you to get here about 6 or 6.15 because we're going to transform that atrium is going to look like you're going to walk into something 80s legit. I promise. I don't even know what the word is to describe it, uh, but we're going to transform the atrium. We're just going to have fun, uh, and then we're going to come in here about 7 o'clock, and we're just going to worship God, and I've got a strong word for us um, about the church that I see moving forward here at Rescue House, and I want you to be a part of that night. Afterwards, we're going to have an ice cream social. Um, we're going to have child care for birth through second grade, okay? So if you have a uh, a child that's third grade and older, they're welcome to come in the experience as well. And so uh, we just want you to come and bring the whole family, and we're just going to have a fun night. You know, Christians aren't really known for throwing very good parties, and we're going to try to redeem that reputation. We're going to renew that reputation this uh, Wednesday night. We're just going to have so much fun, and I want you uh, to be there. Anybody's welcome, so come on. Come on, come on, get here about 6, 6.15, and let's, uh, let's have some fun. If you can't get here that early, if you can just get here at 7 o'clock, come on at 7 o'clock. Come at any time you can uh, to be a part of that night. The second thing I'm really excited about is our next equip seminar. Uh, one of the things that God has really just given me a vision for is that um, it's my job, uh, based on Ephesians 4, to equip you uh, to do the works of ministry and to equip us to do that. And I take very seriously that. And so one of the things that we're doing this brand new, we've already done one at the end of last year, but we're going to do six this year. That's my goal. And the first one uh, that we're going to launch this equip seminar is a his and hers equip seminar. You say, well, what does this mean? It means that we are going to do everything in our power for three weeks at the end, the last three Sundays of February. So the first Sunday in February, Super Bowl Sunday, we're not doing that because you ain't coming. You're going to be eating buffalo wings and chips and dip, and so will I. Uh, but the three Sundays following Super Bowl Sunday, uh, we're going to have this equip seminar called His and Hers. And it's basically us doing everything in our power to equip you to become the best a woman of God in Christ Jesus that you can be and the best man of God that you can uh, be in Christ Jesus. And so what you're going to do is you're going to show up and the men are going to go one place and the women are going to go the other place because there's some things that men struggle with that maybe women don't or there's some things that women go through that we men don't understand. Come on, give me an amen, right? I mean, you know, that. and so this is a chance for us just to kind of split off and uh, we're going to talk about what does it mean, you know, to be the, a man of God? What does it mean to be the leader of your household? What does it mean uh, to, to, to be the best version of yourself in Christ Jesus? And the women, you're going to talk about what does it look like, you know, uh, to, to not struggle with jealousy issues or insecurity or self-worth or, you know, I don't even know all the things um, uh, that women kind of struggle with, um, but my, my wife Lauren is going to help lead kind of the, the women along with some other uh, women, and I and some other lay men are going to help lead that one. And so you have to register for this. You have to sign up for this. And you do that online at rescuehousechurch.org. You can click on Equip Seminar, the banner, and we will have child care for you. Okay, so we're going to take care of the child care. You just come, you show up, and uh, the men are going to go one place, the women are going to go the other. And for three weeks, we're going to talk about what it means to become the best version of ourselves in Christ Jesus. We're going to equip women, equip men, and it's going to be powerful. And you don't have to be married to show up. We're actually allowing high schoolers, uh, high schoolers and up to come to this. And you can be single, you can be married. It doesn't matter if you're a man, you're a woman, uh, you know, high school and up. Uh, we want you to come and be a part of this. But you have to register, you have to sign up. And that's just our way of wanting to equip you and to uh, come beside of you in this journey because we're not meant to do life alone and it's hard and it's uh, tiring at times but together come on we believe we're better together come on clap your hands if you believe we're better together we need those relationships 
Uh, we are actually in a season, as, as a church, we're in a season of renewal, where we are finding a rhythm of renewal. That's kind of the word that God has placed on our heart for this year. Uh, and at the beginning of the year, man, there's no better time than uh, to jump into some actions and to some items that would bring about renewal in our lives. And we've said this over the last few weeks that most people have uphill resolutions uh, with downhill rhythms. In other words, we got a lot of hopes and dreams and, you know, want and uh, things like I want to lose weight this year or I want to spend more time with my family or I want to get a promotion at work this year or maybe this is the year I want to learn how to play an instrument, right? And we've got all these like uphill resolutions, things that take work, things that take action, but we've got downhill rhythms. We don't have rhythms that support the resolutions to uh, give the resolutions legs to cross the finish line. And that's what this series is all about is I want to give you some rhythms uh, that will give your resolutions legs to actually cross the finish line this year because 92% of all resolutions are tossed out by Valentine's Day and we don't want that to happen this year and so we want to hit some root issues we don't want to just hit behaviors we want to hit root issues that are going to sustain your resolutions and I want to encourage you this year uh, if there are things you want to change things you want to see God renew things you want to fix please whatever you do don't try to do it on your own You want to do it with God's help. You don't want to do it in your own ability or your own strength. You will do so much better if you do it God's way and you invite God into the process. I say you will do it way better if you start with God. The Bible is very clear. Romans 12, 2 says this in the message version. Fix your attention On God. If you want to change something in your life, if you want to see renewal come, fix your attention on God and check it out. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it, unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. Isn't that true? And God, check it out, brings the best out of you, develops well formed maturity. In you. Let me ask you a question. You should write this down. Has God uh, brought the best out of me? Have I allowed God to bring the best out of me yet? And that's what God wants to do, but He wants to do it through helping you find uh, rhythms of maturity, and He develops you in that way. And so each week in this series, I want to encourage you, if you have not been here the last couple weeks or you missed a week, please go back online at rescuehousechurch.org and watch these messages. Even if you got to listen to it in the car, whatever you've got to do, because we're finding uh, rhythms and we're, we're building these rhythms on top of one another. And if you will do these five rhythms that we're talking about in this series, your life is going to move to a much better place. And so week number one, rhythm number one, we talked about the secret place. Come on, that was good. we got to get in a rhythm of getting in the secret place with God. That's where the power is. That's where God will tell you the future. It's where He'll he'll tell you secrets about your family. It's where you'll hear the voice of God is in the secret place. And God, I just imagine Him just saying, Hey, I'm waiting on you to come into the secret place. I'm waiting to tell you things and to share things with you, but I'm not going to tell you out in public. I'm going to tell you in private, and you'll experience public reward if you get in private with God and you find the secret place. Don't neglect the secret place, my friends and my family. Rhythm number two was this. This was last week, and boy, was this powerful. Uh, Minds were blown last week as we talk about getting in a rhythm of controlling our thoughts. Because we talk about everything begins with a thought. Do you know that? Every action, every word you say, everything you do, it always begins up here first. And if you can learn to take your thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ, man, if you can get in a rhythm of that, your life is going to move to a healthier place because every action starts with a thought. I told you, if you want to change your life, you start first by changing the way you think. And so we talked about that. It was powerful. Today's rhythm is a giant one, though. It is huge. It is kind of next level. In fact, how you live out this rhythm is going to determine how well all the other rhythms kind of work out. Today's rhythm is going to help you maintain all the other rhythms. And this rhythm has shaped you way more than you realize. This is rhythm number three. Write this down if you want to go to heaven. Uh, Choose the right relationships. That's the rhythm number three. We're going to learn the the rhythm of choosing the right relationships in 
our lives. You are where you are, and you are who you are at this point in your life due to the people you have been around in your life. I promise you, good or bad. And some of these people, come on, you know they weren't your choice. <laughs> you're like, I did not choose you, okay? But you're in my life, and we got to deal with this. Like, I get it. Some of them you didn't choose, but a lot of them you did choose. And you are, come on, the sum total of your relationships. You are, and whether you know it or not, and outside of your decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Choosing your relationships is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. It has that much of an effect on you. Proverbs 27, 19 says this, A mirror reflects a man's face, but what he is really like is shown by the kind of friends he chooses. And so don't tell me choosing your relationships isn't important when the Bible's very clear about that. I tell you all the time, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. I can actually look at your life right now and have a great idea of the type of friends that you choose just by knowing a little bit about you because that has, we are the sum total of who we hang out with, of who we are with, and it's very, very important. And you need to know that you have some choice in this process of who you hang out with. And I'm telling you, it determines a lot about your life, more than you would ever think. And so today, I'm going to give you four verbs, all right? Four relationship choices that you need to make that will change the game, not only for your relationships, but for your life. Number one, here's what we're going to do. Verbs. We're going to nurture the right relationships. We're going to nurture the important relationships. All right, that's first and foremost. And first off, hopefully all of us have some important relationships and some uh, very, the right relationships. I'm talking about our relationship with Jesus. I'm talking about relationship with my spouse or my fiance or relationship with my kids or maybe it's a, a, a godly friend that I have. We're going to learn as followers of Jesus to nurture the important, nurture the right relationships. God has given me a strong vision for the next several years at Rescue House uh, to come alongside of you and to help equip you and, and teach you how to nurture the right relationships in your life. I think it's one of the most important things I can do as a pastor is teach you how to choose and teach you how to nurture and, 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 and develop the right and the most important relationships in your life. If we're being honest, we have a lot of marriages in our church, in both locations and online. We have a lot of marriages that need nurturing in our church family. And it's going to take work, a lot of work, to nurture my marriage and to nurture my relationship with my kids or that godly friend or my relationship with Jesus. You know, somebody said recently to me, it was like, you know, because you know, I, I counsel a lot of couples in our church, and they'll, oftentimes they'll say this, you'll say, you know, I'm just, we're just struggling, and, and we're struggling because there just ain't no fire in our marriage right now. You know, some, this dude, he, he kept saying far. I, I say fire, but he was like, there's no far in our marriage. There's just ain't no far. And I'm like, it's fire, first off. That's what I'm thinking in my head. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there ain't no far in here. It's like, it's my marriage, and it's got a bad marriage. And I just want to be like, that's like looking at a fireplace and saying, that's a bad fireplace because there ain't no far in it, right? Like, I mean, that's why, and I'm... I'm just saying, like, it's not the fireplace's fault, come on somebody, that there's no fire in there. It's your fault. You need to get off your rear end, go outside, brush the wood off, dry it out a little bit. Maybe you need to chop some wood, bring it back on in, go get you some newspaper, strike a match, and put the fire in there. Come on, you got to feed the fire, amen? If you want some fire in your marriage, you're going to have to feed the fire, it takes work, and by work, I mean consistent work, right? Because I'm going to tell you what, once you start getting the fire going, and, and you sit back on your couch, and you're cuddling up, and it's romantic, and all of a sudden, guess what? That fire's going to start to go out, and you got to get your rear end back up, and you got to go do it all over again. And that's what a marriage takes. It's what relationships take. you got to keep working. You, when I say work, I'm talking about consistent work. Come on, you turn to your neighbor and say, you got to feed the fire. Tell them. 
Relationships take work. And can I just tell you this? Can I tell you this? This might be helpful for you. Just because your relationship takes work doesn't mean it's a bad relationship. I think some people think, well, I, you know, I'm just not feeling it anymore, and we just not don't feel like in love anymore, and so, you know, it just it must be a bad relationship. No, it takes work. I love my wife. I, my wife is an angel, and that's a lot. That's harder than you think to deal with. Okay, like her holy wings, like flapping me in the face all the time, telling me what I need to do, right? Blinding me with her halo. It's hard to be married to an angel. Okay. But I'm telling you, and, and I'm a pastor, and we pastor a church, and I'm telling you, it takes work for Lauren and I to make our marriage work. And that doesn't mean it's a bad relationship. It just means we're invested in it. We love each other. We, we're not going to neglect date nights. We're not going to neglect continuing to learn one another because we're different people than when we were in college to where we are now. So we've got to continue to lo- love one another and learn one another. And my love language is words of affirmation. And it's just like when Lauren just says, hey, I want you to know I'm proud of you. I'm like, I am a man right now. You know, like I just feel like legit, right? Like when she's like, hey, I just want you to know that sermon was amazing. It was awesome. I'm just like, I can just feel like I'm Superman, right? Like, I'm a white boy, okay? I'm trying, I'm trying my best, my bad. (laughs) But I just feel like I could do anything and accomplish anything. Lauren, man, for her, like, she has a lot of different love languages, I've learned. But uh, her main one, I I think, uh, is just quality time. And by quality time, I mean, like, just sitting and talking. Like, she loves to just sit, have a moment where we just, like, sit and talk, and I'm like, can we do something while we talk? And she's like, no, we just want to sit and talk. And talk, she does, and I just listen, and she, and she likes that, and it takes work. It takes work to invest in your kids, and, and oftentimes what you want to do is just try to buy them big toys and things and possessions, and I always try to teach you, and I always tell you this, that time is greater than toys. Spend time with your kids. Invest in your kids. The grass is not always greener on the other side. And if it is, the water bill is way higher, trust me, okay? Because they're nurturing it. But I'm telling you, the grass is greener. Come on, you know this. Where you water it, where you nurture it. Can I, this is just might be for somebody today. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't even let that thought come into your brain. Take it captive, make it obedient to Christ, and you stick it out. The Bible is very clear that you'll reap a harvest. You won't grow weary in doing good, and and you won't give up, and you won't bow out. And I know you ain't feeling it. You ain't felt it after two years of being married, because that's when it wears off. But what you have to do is you have to make choices to to work at it and to, to, to invest in it. And guess what? The feelings will follow your choices. Write this down. Feelings aren't facts. And so just because you're feeling it doesn't make it a fact. And so I know sometimes you're not feeling it, but if you make godly decisions and choices to invest in the important relationships, I promise you that feeling will come. And so don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your important relationships. Lead with your choices and your feelings will follow. A couple of exciting things that are coming up, and I'll give you dates at a later time, but in March we're actually going to have a men's night, a men's worship night, where all the men of Rescue House Church I'm, I'm asking you to come, and let's just worship together. Uh, we, we booked an incredible speaker. I'll let you know later about it, an incredible speaker to come in and speak to our men that night. In the fall, we're going to have a ladies' night. We're doing the same thing. Uh, we're going to bring in somebody to speak uh, at that event as well. And then we have already booked our speakers for Thrive Marriage Conference 2020 in February of next year. And so we've got things in place. We want to help you nurture uh, your important relationships. It's a vision that God has put on me. So be looking for those things and take, it, take, the, take us up on those opportunities uh, to, to, to dive deeper in the relationships that are most important. First Peter 4, 7 and 8 says this, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, I love this, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of a sin. We believe love covers, that love wins, and when we do that, but it takes work. Number two, 
So first, we're going to nurture the important relationships. Number two, we're going to restore my broken relationships. Now, this is very, very painful at times. I get it. Uh, If something is broken, there's been some pain involved. But I promise you, the pain of continuing to live in bitterness and unforgiveness is more painful than actually trying to fix and restore the broken relationship. So I know some of you in here, this is hard for you because you feel like, man, I'm trying to do all that I can do, but the other person isn't, isn't willing to play ball, and so it's kind of one-sided here. And the Bible actually addresses that in Romans 12, 17, and 18. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, so you do all that you can do, live at peace with everyone. So if you can't live at peace with them or they don't have peace with you, at least do all that you can do so that you can have peace with yourself. Settle it in your heart that you're going to forgive them. This is such an important principle that in what we know as the Lord's Prayer, uh, Jesus added it in. I call it the daily prayer. This is the God teaching us how to pray and to forgive those who trespass against us. And so when I pray and I ask God for forgiveness, I always ask him for strength to forgive others. Why? Because if I don't forgive others, I do not believe that God will forgive me. God, forgive me at the same level to which I forgive. And I forgive people honestly because I need it probably more than they do. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm forgiving people Maybe more for me, maybe it's a little bit more selfish because I know what it does to me and to my heart and to my relationship with Jesus. I believe this, that if you have any unforgiveness in your heart or bitterness in your heart, you will not be able to lead a successful life with that in your heart. And the Bible is very clear, God is very clear, if you do not forgive, if you just choose not to forgive, and forgiveness is a choice, if you don't do it, I don't believe that God will forgive you. Unforgiveness is like setting yourself on fire and hoping the other person dies of smoke inhalation. Unforgiveness hurts you more than it hurts them. Colossians 3.13 says this, Bear with one another and forgive one another. And if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And this is why I don't care what you do to me, or what happens to me, I am commanded by my Heavenly Father who has forgiven me so much. I'm commanded by Him to forgive. Sometimes I'll even preemptively give or forgive. I will, I will say, God, whoever wrongs me today or maybe somebody uh, says something about me this week, God, I just want you to know I'm going to go ahead and preemptively forgive them. I'm going to go ahead and release it to you. And there's somebody in here or watching online or at our Winston campus who you have unforgiveness in your heart. And the best thing you can do today is just release that to the Lord. And you just say, God, I, they don't owe me anymore. I forgive them. And you make that decision to forgive and begin to fix and restore uh, a broken relationship. Number three, this might be one of the hardest ones, is to sever any harmful relationships. We're going to sever any harmful relationships. Now, can I just disclaimer, I am not talking about your husband or your wife, okay? Like some of y'all are just like, man, I just got my ticket. I'm going to go home and look at my husband and say, Pastor Matt said, get up on out of here. All right? No, I'm not talking about your husband. I'm not talking about your wife. I'm talking about the relationships that we've allowed in our life that are not good for you. And some of you are in a relationship right now that's toxic and uh, is harmful to not only your life, but your relationship with Jesus. And maybe you feel stuck, or maybe you just feel like, man, I just, I don't know what's going to happen if I, if I sever this or break up with him or her, and I just don't know what the future looks like. But in the words of the great theologian Luke Combs from Appalachian State, what I thought would be the death of me was my saving grace. It's a country song, y'all. And who knows, you might not have to see your ex-future mother-in-law anymore, right? Like Some of y'all need to listen to WTQR. But more than ever, people uh, in this day and time, as I see and been doing this for 10 years, more people than ever 
are having flirtatious uh, conversations over Facebook and social media, and that just, the devil just feeds on that, and it eventually takes you out. There's a story, this is a true story, you can totally look it up. There's a husband and a wife, and at the same time, they were cheating on one another, and they didn't know it, obviously, and they were using Facebook to kind of do it, and so she was kind of talking to her new man, and, you know, he was talking to you know, her, his new woman, and, and they were having these conversations, and, 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 you know, they just weren't happy in the marriage, and so they set up a time simultaneously, you know, she was going to meet with him, and he was going to meet with her, and uh, they had it all figured out, and they were conversating, and then they show up, and guess what? They was cheating on each other with each other. Can you believe that? They were having an affair with each other, and they got so mad about it when they showed up at each other that they got a divorce. I'm like, y'all were like, what is going on here? Like, it just, it's amazing. There are stats out there that more affairs start on Facebook than any other medium that's out there. And no longer are people like hooking up at the club and stuff like that. They're starting flirtatious, dangerous conversations online behind their keyboard or behind their phone. And it just escalates. And you think, oh, this isn't very harmful. And all of a sudden, God just, conti- or, you know, the enemy takes you to another level. I would encourage you, if you've ever had those feelings or thoughts, I want you to read Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. Those chapters, Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. And those chapters, I tell other pastors sometimes, you read that scripture, and those chapters, because it shows you uh, that it's not worth it. It shows you what happens to an adulterous relationship like that, and it's not worth it. I'm telling you, listen to me, this is for somebody. It will ruin everything you've ever worked for, and it'll take you out. And it's not worth it over a few minutes of pleasure. And the enemy's a great deceiver in that. And I'll tell people all the time, if you've got to change jobs, if you've got to move states, if you've got to go to another country, you do whatever you have to do to make sure that you don't engage in that. Go live with your mama if you have to, right? Like, whatever you have to do. And I'll be honest with you, I'm a pastor, but I'm also a man, and, and I have to remind myself almost weekly I do this. This might be TMI, but I do. I almost remind myself... Uh, weekly of the fallout if I were to ever engage in an affair. And I think about it. I think about the hundreds, if not thousands of people I would disappoint. I think about the hundreds, if not thousands of people who would walk away from God. I think about all of the children in our children's ministry and how many of their lives would be altered by maybe leaving this church and maybe never stepping foot back into a church. I don't know. But one decision by me could disappoint and ruin a lot of people's lives. And I'm just telling you, it's not worth it. And so if that's you, the moment you walk, you need to cut it off. You need to text them and say, it's O-V-E-R. Okay, you need to like tell them. (laughs) Tell them it's over. Cut it off. Do what you got to do. Proverbs 13, 20 says this, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. And I just don't want you to walk through that. It's so painful, and it's not worth it. Fix your attention on God. Don't let it destroy your life in a way that you cannot even imagine. Here's the fourth choice, and this is a happy one. The other ones were kind of like, you know, maybe a little bit more serious. but And this is serious, but it's a happy one. Number four is we're going to initiate some meaningful relationships. So we're going to start some relationships that we don't have maybe with, with people who are godly people. We want godly friends, godly mentors. And a lot of people want that, but they're not willing to do what you got to do to have those type of people in your life. And the Bible recognizes that the gravitational pull for us is to actually not do this and to not set up godly relationships and godly men and women and surround ourselves with those type of people, especially men. I mean, men are like, I can do it all by myself, you know, and you can't. You weren't meant to do life alone. All of us need meaningful relationships, but it takes work. It's an uphill rhythm. Hebrews 10, 25 says this, 
Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit or rhythm of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. He's talking about the day that Jesus is coming back. We've got to meet together. We've got to initiate some meaningful relationships. So the, for the rest of our time, the next 10 minutes, I want to just give you uh, four or five ways. We'll see how many we can get to. I don't know if we'll get to all of them. Four or five ways that you can initiate a healthy relationship. These are relationships that you need to initiate. Number one is you need to develop a relationship with my church. Okay, you need not not my church is per se. Uh, I'm just saying you need to own a body of believers. You need to say maybe it's Rescue House. I'm inviting you to make this my church, right? Like, uh, but you don't have to. But I'm talking about becoming an owner within a church and to find a place of belonging. You'll move to a better place when you invest and you choose to belong. There are actually 30 scriptures in the New Testament that you cannot live out if you're not connected to a body of believers. The Bible makes this assumption that you're just going to be a part of a body of believers. Ephesians 2.9 says this, You are members of God's very own family, and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. In other words, you're not just attenders. You're members of God's family. And my hope is that you'll become an owner of Rescue House Church. This will be my church. It'll be your church. And we know that it's God's church. We know it's Jesus' church, and He's building His church. I get all that. But we're co-heirs with Christ, and we can claim the things that are His. And He said we are going to go on to do greater things, and He said He was going to build His church through us. And so we can claim this and say, yes, we know this is Jesus' church, but it's my church as well, and I'm going to build this church in Jesus' name. And I realize that a lot of you in here Maybe you have just kind of been in a season where you come and sit and you're just an attender, okay? And is there a season for that? Absolutely. Is there a time where you just kind of come in and like you don't give anything, serve anything, do anything? You just sit and just kind of take in? Yes. I mean, you come in and you take as long as you need based on the past that you have. But can I just tell you, you can't stay that way. You can't stay that way. At some point, you got to get involved where you belong. And I'm telling you, there's a place for everybody here to belong. And you will never really discover the the best relationships in your life if you don't commit to them and you belong to one another. Okay? Lauren and I, when we were dating, we were attenders. I would take her out for a date. I would take her back and drop her off, go to my house, right? Like we were attenders. But eventually, I said, I need you. We need to become members. And I asked her to marry me. And there's some privileges when you become a member, right? Like, and it's awesome. But there's also responsibility. And I want you to begin to own uh, this church. These are my chairs. And these are, this is my drum set. And this is my church. And this is my children's ministry. And that's my pastor. And that's like, begin to take ownership of this house. This is your church. I, I can't stand it when somebody comes up and be like, your church. I'm like, you've been coming here for three years. Like, this is your church too, bruh. You know, like, it's, we're family here. And we can begin to own that. And so uh, it doesn't have to be this one, but you need to own a church and develop that relationship. Number two, we're going to develop my relationship with godly friends. We're going to have a set of godly friends. How well do you know, uh, or how how do I know if they're godly or not? Well, when you hang out with them, do you become more godly? That's how you know if you're hanging out with godly people. Is this group of people always dragging you down, or are they dragging you up? And that will decide, hey, is this these godly friends? And this was kind of the rhythm of the early church, is they would meet together and they would share with one another. And yes, they had big times of worship, but they, they, they more so met in the homes and they would, uh, and it's like our connect group ministry. And that's where the growth would happen, is in the groups and in a circle. That's where real life change would happen. That's what Acts 2.44 says about the new believers. All the believers, they met together constantly and shared everything with each other. They shared everything with each other. Now, a lot of times our mind goes straight to their possessions is what they shared. But the key to an awesome group, an awesome circle of friends, godly friends, is when you get to a comfort level, when you feel free to share. Share what? The real you. 
the real you. Because come on, let's not, let's not uh, act like all of us aren't wearing masks right now. Because we are. All of us are. I am too. There are some things you don't know about me. And I ain't going to tell you either, right? And you ain't going to tell me either, right? Like we're all here wearing a mask. And what I love about Connect Groups, what I love about our group's ministry is it allows you to take off the mask and it allows you to be comfortable to be you and to share you and to share what you're really feeling and to share your raw emotions and to really share your struggles and you get a chance uh, to be the real you. And so I don't tell you everything that I'm going through. I'm kind of a TMI pal. I tell you a lot more than I probably should. But there, I don't get up here and tell you when I'm discouraged because I'm, I'm here to encourage you, okay? And so I don't tell you that. But there are some people in my life that I do have that I go and I tell and I say, I'm discouraged about this. Like, I'm struggling with this. And so I might not tell you, but I have somebody I can tell. And do you have a platform? Do you have a group of people? that you can share that with, and you can take off the mask, and you can share the real you. I'm going to tell you what, that's where spiritual growth happens in our church. Spiritual growth doesn't really happen very much. I mean, it does a little bit in the rows, but when you get in a circle of friends, godly friends who love you no matter what and allow you just to be you and you can take off the mask, boy, that is where true spiritual growth happens around the presence of Jesus and the Word of God. And so you're in luck today. Today, actually, we're launching our spring and our, our winter and spring semester of Connect Groups. And I want to encourage you to get in a group. Get in a group. Get in a group. Do whatever you got to do to get in a group. If you want to start a group, start a group. Let me know. We'll, we'll start a group. We'll do whatever we got to do uh, to, to begin uh, these groups. And there were some people that actually sat down uh, with our creative team, and they just shared what Connect Groups uh, has meant to them. And so I want you to turn your attention to the screen and uh, check out uh, these video of our family. We were looking for a group that we could kind of become good friends and we could share we were just looking to build relationships with people outside of our normal friend group. Find a set of people that you can have fellowship with. To us, it just it, uh, it got us involved in church. In order to really get to know people, um, I would have to be a part of a smaller group. And we made the decision then that, you know, this is something that we need to prioritize our lives around. I wanted to connect with um, <clears throat> other believers. Let's still grow up. <laughs> as a Christian. I needed to branch out more um, to get to know people better. We really didn't know each other mm -hmm. until the Connect group. Nope. We're not friends, we're family. It's almost like a little family. They're family. We made friends immediately and, and we had those close connections and we've been with the same group, give or take, for for several years now. You also have conversations about your family and what's happening in your life and your job and it just, you get closer. I went through a time this past spring when I lost both of my grandfathers within five days of each other and our connect group. Um, it was amazing um, when our connect group came um, and supported us. We have seen lots of answers to prayer deeper conversations with people that are going through life um, the same stuff that we are. So it's opened me up to say some things I have never said before. Connect Group to me is a, an opportunity for me to ask all the questions that I think about on Sundays when I'm sitting in church. It's the opportunity for us to make mistakes and ask questions and um, you know just be better at it. It's almost like your walk with Jesus is in black and white and then when you get with a group of people it, it, it becomes alive in color. I think the biggest thing is is that there's people going through the same struggles that you are. And I can't see myself doing life by myself anymore. And you eat good too. <laughs> and you eat together. Yeah. The food's good. Lots of food. Yeah. We bring food and we share it. That's how we celebrate. You know, you get together and you feast. That's what families do. That is what we do. That's what our family does. I 
it, ma- it has made a huge difference in my life, in, in our relationship. When we started the Connect Group, I was a stay-at-home mom, so it was just me and kids, and um, so the adult interaction was really good for me. I think it's only it's it's only grown our relationship. Life wasn't meant for you to be alone. We all come together. Um, we all bring something to the table. Um, you just see how it changes your life. Just see how your heart grows because you, you gained family. It gives you a chance to get involved with other people, to go out into the community, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. It's just a wonderful experience, and I would just encourage anybody to, to become a part of that. You've got to join a connect group. our hands for our family members and our group there there I'm telling you I'm telling you I'm in, I'm in contact with uh, these connect groups and there's just life change every single week coming out of them and listen I know you got a lot of things going on I like a lot of things competing for your schedule I get it uh, but one of the best things you could ever do one of the best decisions you could ever make is to choose godly friends and to godly relationships that challenge you that that pray for you that you know, you can take the mask off. You can remove it. And uh, I want to encourage you to do that today. Uh, after the experience today, actually our Moxville Connect Group leaders, uh, many of them who have room and, and, and have openings in their groups are going to be out there holding signs and they're going to be holding their phone uh, ready to register you today. And listen to me, I know that it can be awkward all right. I know it can be awkward to like walk up to somebody that you don't know, and and, and but hey, uh, what you're doing isn't working. Like take a leap of faith and uh, and sign up for a group today and give it a chance. And after two weeks, if it ain't for you, then it ain't for you, right? But give it a shot and give it a chance. I really want to encourage you to to try to jump into community and, and what it will do, and uh, and watch it do incredible things in in your life. If you don't feel comfortable like signing up right now on the spot, you can always look online at rescuehousechurch.org. You can click on the Connect Groups banner. They'll walk you through that in a minute, and you can sign up online. But I want to challenge you to not even leave this. If you know this is your next step to find some community, um, find one of those Connect Groups out there. And then maybe, okay, so you don't find one that maybe fits you or whatever. Start one. Like, begin one. And, uh, and invest in this Connect Group's ministry. You know, God has given me a bold vision, um, and it's not really a numeric goal because I'm kind of done with that, but I do envision at some point at Rescue House's history that we would have more people in Connect Groups than we actually have on a Sunday morning. Now, what kind of gr- spiritual growth would that look like? How would we grow as a church if we actually had more people in connect groups throughout the week than we actually had on Sunday morning. And I just feel like God's given me a kind of a bold vision for that. And we want to continue to develop that ministry because it's making such a difference in so many people's uh, lives. And so that's your next step today. Um, The last thing I'll share with you, and then I got to go. But number four is to develop my relationship with God. Okay? This is important. This is the most important one is to develop my relationship with God. And I want to just say this right here. Have you ever wondered or have you ever thought what it would look like seriously? Come on, this is for somebody today. If you decided today, walking out of here, I'm going to go all in with God. Like, I'm not just going to like halfway do it. I'm not just going to straddle the fence. You know, after 10 years of ministry, um, I've heard a lot of people say, well, I'm going I'm to try God. Uh, I'm going to give him a chance. And I've even said that before and just to try to get people into a relationship with God and to test him out. But I've learned, like, that's like you saying, well, today I'm going to try to go be in the NBA. You ain't going to be in the NBA, all right, unless you, like, work at it, unless you give everything to it. And I placed my faith uh, in Jesus when I was 12 years old, but it wasn't until 22 that I decided to go all in and give everything I had. Up until that point, I just had my fire insurance card, right? I just want to make sure I didn't burn. But at age 22, I thought there's more to this than just getting into heaven and escaping hell. 
It's about going all in. And would 2019 be the year that you said, all right, God, I'm going I'm to put all my chips in the center, and I'm going to go all in. And I wasn't ready up until the time I was 22 to, to go all in, you know. But then I started thinking about it. Isn't that what we do when we show up to a sports arena? Isn't that what we do when we show up to a concert? We go all in. I mean, we're willing to do some crazy things. We're willing to pay like $20 for parking, and it's two miles away, and we got to walk all the way to the venue or the stadium, right? We've got on all the gear uh, to support that team or that band, and we pay hundreds of dollars to, to see them in action. And then when we get in there, we act a fool, and we actually live out the scriptures more in the stadium or the concert arena than we do in church. We actually live out the Psalms where it says, lift up holy hands and stand up and shout and give glory, right? Like we do all that when we get into those arenas and, and when we go to the sports arena, when we go to the concert, we go all in. And I've just decided from the, from the time I was 22, I'm going to go all in with God. And I'm going to tell you what, honestly, I am not going to give my best to a sports team or to a, a concert artist, and not give my best to my Heavenly Father who knows my name and created me in His image. I'm going to give Him my best. I'm going I'm to do it. I'm going to worship Him with everything I've got. When I stand on the stage and preach to you, I'm going to go all in. And I'm just challenging you. This year, would you go all in with Christ? Would you go all in with God? Part of that is... And a big decision of that is who you surround yourself in. Are you surrounded around people who have went all in? And if you'll do that, I'm telling you, get in a connect group. Get in a connect group. Get in a group. Try it out. Give it a chance. Go all in. You know, the Bible says this in Jeremiah 29, 13. I love this. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. And I know there's somebody sitting in here being like, is God really real? Is he really who he said he is? And I promise you, if you look for him wholeheartedly, you go all in, you'll find him. And honestly, he'll find you. And you can cross from death to life by placing your faith in Jesus. It'll be the best year of your life. The best, best two decisions you could ever make is to follow Jesus, place your faith in him, and then surround yourself with godly people. And if you do that, your rhythm of life is going to move to a better place. Come on, pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this word. I pray that we would live it out. God, I pray that many people would sign up for a group today, get involved in what you're doing, get in a circle, God. They would be encouraged. They would be prayed for. God, I pray that they would feel comfortable to share. They would take off the mask um, and really live out all that you have designed for them and purposed them to do. And so, God, I pray that today was a fruitful day, that this message was not something that goes in one ear and out the other. But, God, it's a, a message that falls fresh on our hearts and inspires us to action and to implement. And I pray, God, that we have many today uh, who find and nurture the important relationships in their life. God, I pray that you would give somebody the boldness and the strength to sever a relationship that is toxic. Um, and I just anything you put on our hearts, God, because you say so, uh, we will. We love you, Jesus, and it's in Christ's name we pray. And everybody said, come on, let's clap our hands for God and what he's done for us in our life.